My hypothesis is that the emergence of modernity as a social logic is not to be found in the sole market form as asserted by the liberal and uh, in, somehow by Marx himself. Modernity would actually happen in the coupling of the two mediation, market and organization, under the claim of the submission to a, a regime of public speech, of discourse, communicative discourse. Taking the question this way, does that mean that this claim is verified in reality, but only in accordance to the Marxian approach? That, is, that it is from such a metastructure that we can account for the class structure which is specifically that of the modern form of society. And this leads to a new understanding of modern history. If this hypothesis is correct, it happened an historical era, a, a time, in which the official slogan of liberty, equality, rationality would obscurely and gradually prevail. That of a public sociality ultimately governed by the standards of common speech discourse shared amongst equals. I argue that the historical location of this first oligarchic but structurally extensible phenomenon, the, the location of the emergence of modernity is the cultural space of the modest urban centers of medieval Europe. At the beginning, it, uh, is not the capitalist at the beginning of modernity, is not the capitalist market, but the metal structural configuration of which, of which market is only one part. This hypothesis opposed the Anglo-American Marxist school, Robert Brunner, uh, Ellen Maiskin's Wood, which considers as the historically relevant question that of the beginning of capitalism, i.e. <coughs> of the competition on a free market for profit uh, located in the English 16th, 17th century. My, my own view is more in harmony with another historian tradition illustrated by Annal School and his today followers who recognize in the city-states of the Italian 13th uh, century the first outline of modern society. The difference between Athens, Athen and Florence, between this Italian uh, medieval republic and those of antiquity, is that the, the, the former, uh, <coughs> I mean, Athens, are, uh, is exclusively political, uh, while this, the latter, the Italian ones, includes also economic activity. In this historical conjecture, in which the old empire, Rome, and its successors collapse uh, about uh, the, the, the 1,000, collapse and sovereignty split into small pieces, the Italian city gathers uh, a population of merchant producers and craftsmen, including their employees, who face the initial urban feudalism and become eventually strong enough to demand and obtain to participate in economic and political, legislative, judicial and executive power. Modernity begins with a popular revolution, with a, a lot of popular revolution in the, in the city. Of course, the revolution fails, as always. <laughs> and the feudal return, but its underground life continues creating the foundation of modern political cr culture, of which Machiavelli is the symbol, and uh, that is uh, what reappears in the Reformation and the, in the great revolution of the 18th and 19th century. And as you see, uh, this um, hypothesis engages a new reading of the subsequent history. <coughs> uh,
drop the floor. Drop the floor. Um, 对，从第四页做插图。第二层开始呢，他就开始对那个哈登马斯。和一九七六年写的那个《重建历史维普里》这本书做出评论，那么他认为对哈德马斯这本书中就有一种西方优越感，对，充满了一种西方优越感。呃，那么他说，为了逃离这种困境，就克服这种困境，你就必须呃，在两个特征上来赋予这种设想，就是给这种设想赋予两个特征，一个是是历史的，就是说。呃，就是就是说，它是历史的，就是就是哈德马斯谈到那个重建历史唯物主义。另一个就是发生学的，就是说认为，呃，就是根据种和类的那种进化来来谈到这种历史、社会历史的发展。嗯，他还谈到这个哈德马斯，他是呃用了一种前所未有，用了一种就是人类的共同资源。嗯，那么他就举了个例子，他说这个在亚当斯密和卡呃。马克思那里，他都使用了这种共同的人类资源，比如说亚当斯密，他更强调那种交换功能，而那个马克思呢，更强调自由人之间的这种合作，这两者呢，都是人类的一种共同的一种资源。嗯、呃，但是他说。说这个，但是他二者吧，就是亚当斯密和马克思呢，他都赋予这个一种资源以特殊的、特权的地位。比如说亚当斯密就赋予这个交换功能以特，就是特殊的位置，而马克思呢，把人类之间的这种合作、自由人之间的这种合作赋予更为突出的位置。这就是说批判他们俩。嗯，至于他，就是说这个贾斯比代，他声称这种种类的资源可以在。呃，这种交换和合作的这种下面来，下面或者背后寻找到，那就是在这种 media mediation， 就是在调解的下面，那么就是在这种呃纪实的那种叫话语或者是那种论辩当中能发现这种共同的资源，就是说他还是呃。呃，我我我自己认为他还是采取了哈德马斯的那个立场，就是认为在那个呃沟通和话语那个即时当下也能寻找到这种人类的共同资源。那么他就是沿着哈德马斯这个路子继续去分析，嗯、呃，谈到这个，他嗯通过引用哈德马斯这个交往交往行为，他引出另外一个概念，就是社会契约 （social contract）， 就是说，嗯，如果我们要是去实践这个交往行为的话。那么就是非常准确的，我们就需要一种社会契约的一种需要。嗯，那么他就对于他来说，他对于哈德马斯这个范式进行了一种不同的呃重构或者解读。嗯、呃，他认为这个现代性的这个特征，嗯、呃，将通过这种交往行为，把交往行为这种诉求作为一种社会生活和公共。公共体、公共机制的一种，呃，官一种官方的原则 ，official principle 是一个一个正式的一个官方的原则，就是把社会契约放进来。那么，所以他重新开始了一种一种模式，叫 discursive contract contractual， 就是说，既是话语的，也是一种契约的一种模式。那这种模式呢，就把两个概念连接在一起，一个是话语，一个是契约。呃，他把它放在一种纯分析的文件中，呃，对，他就为了建立现代性，他提出一个一个是话，一个是契约。呃，他认为现代性就是不但要需要这种这种话语的诉求，就是像哈德马斯谈，而且还有一种契约的这种表述，就是他谈到，所以为什么现在需要就是说有一种叫呃呃 a r r a g e m e n t of course， 就是民主讨论的一种政治制度，他说要需要这种诉求。那么他说，他所建构的这种重构的这种范式呢，嗯、呃，的影响是非常大的。他提出一个优点，就是说他能跟，呃，这种普遍的经验，就是对适用于所有人类，就是这种所有这种交往关系当中的一个，他能跟这些相互关联。嗯，那么，嗯，对他的他的呃观点就是我的设想就是。现代性的出现，就作为一种社会逻辑，现代性的出现不仅仅在单独的市场形式中发现，就像呃自由自由主自由主义者或者像马克思所提出
所提到的，现代性还发生在就是两个两个媒介或者两个调节的那种相互连接当中，这两个媒介就是一个是市场，一个就是组织，在市场和组织，呃，这两。级或者两个相互连接，因为它前面已经强强调这是两级嘛，那么这两级之下还要都服从于这种公共言谈和话语的领域，就是说，他把现代性分为两呃两个部分，一个是 market， 一个是 organization， 但是这两个呢还要服从于这种屈服于这种公共言谈和话语的这个领域，这是它的一个核心观点。最后，最后那一大那三部分，它主要是证明了现代性到底产生在哪个哪个地哪个时代。他认为不是像那个像呃说的这个是，就他的一个主要观点就是说，现代性不是产生那种纯市场的那种经济领域，而是产生在一种最早产生在一种文化空间，就是说，呃，就是那种中世纪欧洲中世纪的那种中等城市的那种。城市空间，呃，不是文化空间，他强调那种文化空间，就是说不单单是那种光纯追求利润的那种市场，而且还有那种文化的，就是两个因素都有的那种。然后他就证明，他就通过历史，他通过这个年鉴学派来证明，呃，最早是出现那个十三，应该是十三世纪的意大利的某个地方，某某个城市，就是他的一个观点。OK。呃、uh, ，I will drop the the part because my my paper is a little long. But <clears throat>、uh, now I come to、uh, to the structure of modern society. Point two two, and more specifically on the relation between social classes and political parties. Uh, uh, well, it just yeah.、Uh, it must be yeah. Page nine. From page nine, I come to yeah. You can put a part page ten. Yeah, page ten yeah. is this one. Yeah, the、yeah. uh, table here. Yeah, all as a reference. You have a look at it. <coughs>、uh, well, I, I explain this、uh, this table. <coughs> We saw that market and organization.、Uh, Yes, market and organization、uh, refers to the polar, two polar forces, both converge,、uh, converging and antagonistic. Yeah, this meta structure, structure,、uh, practice, and、uh, the, in the meta structural fiction, there are two poles, and these two poles have. Yeah, market and organization, which has two faces,、uh, economical and you, you, you political. And in the structure of class structure of society, you have the dominant class has two poles: one based on the market, and the other based on organization. But it's the same class. There's two poles、uh, converging but ant- antagonistic, and the Fundamental class is also splitted uh, uh, among which、uh, factor is more important: self-employed or administration, and in the middle, I, w- I would say working class or employees of the private. And well, and here is the problem of the parties, political parties. So、uh, we saw. <coughs> That market and organization refer to the two polar forces, both converging and antagonistic, which constitute the dominant class. There are, inclu- there are indeed two classes, but not according to the traditional uh, uh, to, to the traditional capitalist working class pattern. The pertinent divide, in my opinion, is between. Capitalist owner and manager and competent elite on the, on the top, and at the bottom the fun, what I call the fundamental class. We can understand why the fundamental class has always sought the alliance, the political alliance, with the elite pole, because the power of competence has actually another nature 
than that of property. Briefly, <coughs> the power of competence m makes itself felt only by exposing itself, by communi communicating somehow. Clearly, it is thus structurally, yeah, it, clearly it is thus structurally reproduced as, <coughs> as class, but remains more open to criticism and subversion. And uh, this power of the competent is less dramatically uh, submitted than the power of capitalist owners to the logic of abstract wealth. The organization maintains uh, with discourse, with discourse, quite a different relation that the market does. In this regard, the classical mar classical Marxism presents a surprising buyer. It theorizes a supposedly two-class game, identified as capitalist and wage worker. But in fact, in the real politics, in the history, it impiles it inspires contradictorily a constant political practice that actually subreptitiously engages, engages not two but three pro protagonists. The fundamental class is one and the, the two elements of the dominant class, the capitalist owners and the managers and competent. And what is even more surprising, despite take place on a political scene that includes only two places, right and left, which, and this is in my opinion the height of irony, do not correspond to the duality of the involved class, uh, capitalist and uh, the dominant class and fundamental class, but <coughs> to, to the dual pole of domination. Right, on the right you, you find the finance, and on the left you find the competent. Not that the principle, uh, I can go further, not that the principle of formal legitimacy or the principle of government by the majority, which divides the political scene into two parts, yeah, this principle, formal principle, says by itself nothing of, of the substance of the disputes between majority and main minority, between those two parts. However, it's not worthy that this formal majority mi minority couple determines constantly a substantial right left uh, left right divide or vice versa. It's paradoxical in fact. Uh, 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 well, which is indicative, which is significant, of a very specific social, economic, and ideological content. Put briefly, the right gives the right gives more power to property; the left more power to organization. That should give rise to a theor theoretical astonishment, as we can see, the paradox that right left does not match uh, with class division but with the bipolarity within the dominant class becomes clear only from the metastructural analysis yeah i mean there is it is a r really paradoxical the right left is not a divide be between the dominant and dominated or fundamental class but right left is a divide be between finance and elite, uh, the two poles of dominant class. And that's a thing that, in my view, only the metastructural analysis, analysis can explain. It is also with the